Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Fall is coming and it's time to change out the annuals for winter. Also, just because it's winter does not mean you can't grow food. That's just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to the Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Joellen Diamond. Joellen is the Director of Landscape at the University of Memphis, and Carol Reese will be joining me later. All right, Joellen, you know I always look forward to this every season, right? Yes. Right. Yeah, well, you, we got to look, look at what we've done this last season. And I have to tell you, the salvia did great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, marigolds, eh, but the petunias, yeah. oh my goodness. <laughs> no. I guess petunias do not uh, like irrigation. Oh, uh, yeah. So hmm. we won't be putting the, and look, we've got some volunteer vinca from uh. the previous years. So, but it's time to put in pansies for the fall and winter season, okay. and it's time to take all of this up. So let's get started and we'll gather this and put it in the compost pile. All right. All right. Yep, not much. Uh, now to prepare for our pansy planting, I'm gonna let you okay. put that one in there. Uh, for our pansy planting, we're gonna put down, now there's still some mulch on this from previously, but we'll dress it up just a little bit. But first we need to put down a complete fertilizer okay. that has a little bit of uh, temperature uh, de deployment, meaning that depending on the temperature is how much with water it will uh, release to the plants. Yeah. And we need to do that at the beginning of this fall because we want the plants to get off to a good start. Okay. So there's no real rhyme or reason to it, just you want to put down enough. So what, what my uh, mother used to call uh, feeding the chickens. <laughs> so you just chicken. put enough down right. so you can see it. And it's not necessarily, I don't want to put too much down, just enough. Then we'll get the uh, mulch out because these pansies are so small that we don't need to put the mulch down after we plant them. And let's just, yeah, just just out pour a out bit. a little bit all along. That's all right. Okay. Yeah, and we can just kind of move it around just a little bit just to dress it up. Cover up our fertilizer. This year, for this fall, I picked a mix of pansies with what they call faces, which means it ha they have um, a dark uh, center that s tends to make them look like faces. Okay. And it's just a mix of colors. We've not used this particular pansy before, so oh, we're going to see goody, how goody. it does this year. Yeah, let's see how it does. And as we get them out, very nice, pretty pansy. Nice. The roots are nicely spaced in the, the container. Nothing terrible. I would not try to disturb these because it looks just fine with plenty of, of uh, soil space between the roots. Mm -hmm. And we'll start setting them out, and then we'll set them out, and then we'll plant them. Okay. And how, how are you going to set them out? I know there's a rhyme to what you do. I, I usually put them in a pyramid or a triangular grid pattern. That way when they start filling in, they'll uh, close in together and weigh one solid mass of pansies. Got it. And we have to remember, we have, um, we have daffodil bulbs in this bed. Yes, that's right, I forgot about so that. So if we come across those, we will uh, try to go around them. Okay. Again, in a, in a, like if you have two round through here, we'll put one here, and then when I come back for the next row, 
we will go in between. Got it. Okay. All right, well, I'll let you knock some of these, what we call knock them out of the pot. All righty. And then I'll start placing them. Okay. Sounds like a plan to me. And squeeze on the bottom a little bit. Yep, and you can have the okay. tag also. And pansies get about 8 to 12 inches round, so you want to space them. We're going to space them about 8 inches apart, because we want them to fill in fairly fast. I'm going to start making the second row by going in between these. Looks like we'll have enough for a fourth row up front, but we'll plant these three first. It'll be easier to reach them. There we go. Well, now that we have these three rows set out, we'll go ahead and plant them before we finish the first row on the front. Okay. And again, when you're planting these pansies, you don't want to plant these too deep because right at the soil surface of pansies are the crown of the plant and they do not like to be buried. Okay. So I tend to plant these a little shallow and maybe throw a couple of bark, pieces of bark from the mulch up over the top of them, but I, I don't like to bury them okay. because they do better without being buried. All right, so don't bury the crown, right? Don't bury the crowns. Shallow. So since there's mulch here, we're gonna move the mulch out of the way Oops. And any weeds we find. <laughs> Definitely. And we'll dig our hole. Set our plant in. Again, without burying the crown. The yeah, crown. And push the mulch back over around it. Okay. Of course, the pansies we've got here probably were grown from plugs that a, that a company bought to grow them on, but um, you can buy seeds of pansies. The problem is their germination temperature is so low, around 60, 65 degrees, and you know, a lot of the country, like we, it, it, we would not be able to do it because they would never germinate because it's too hot here. So growing from seed, and, and farther north in, in zones um, four, three, two, they, you could probably grow the seeds because it'd be cool enough for them. But in this part of the country, not. They're, it's just too hot. All right. All right. Well, that's the three rows. About that, so three rows? Yeah. Now we got room for one more row. We have some more pansies. So we'll right. finish the last row. That's good. So now we'll plant this last row. I haven't run into any of the bulbs. No, I haven't either. Yeah, think so we're doing good. And we would like mature plants because these will look fine now and clear into spring when we change them out. So. So we get a lot of season out of our pansies, whereas some of the other zones don't get as many months of growth out of them. In fact, some places use these as summer annuals. They have such cool weather, so we, don't, we aren't that lucky. We have to make sure that during times of drought that they will have some water, especially when they're starting to establish. All right. Yay, we got to the that? end. We got there. So that's the faces pansy bed for the fall and the winter. All right, can't wait to see what it looks like. Gonna be a Once lot of pretty colors. Going, I guess we get it watered and all that good stuff now, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, water it in. Thank you, Joel, I appreciate that. No problem. All right. We're in the square foot garden here at the family plot and it's time to harvest basil. It is a tender annual, and so when the cold weather comes, it's gonna die anyway. And it really holds its flavor well when it's dried, so that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna harvest the, the uh, basil, 
And the best way to do it is just cut it right at the ground and get the whole plant. And there's several ways you can dry it. Usually what I do is kind of take out the, the, the bad looking foliage or the leaves and then I just hang it up just like this using a string or a big rubber band and hang it up in a hot dry place. At my house, that is a room above our garage. So anywhere that is hot and dry and dark, and it usually this time of year with the temperatures being what they are, it dries in just probably four or five days. And at that point, you just get it and this will all be dried up and you just start you know, brushing it off. It'll crumble right off of there. And then you can put it in jars and seal it up and label it and put it in a cool, dry, dark place in your kitchen. So it's real handy to start using all through the winter. Ms. Kara, it's always good to have you here. Always fun to be here. <laughs> always good to have you. Now, let's talk about cool season edibles. So there are cool season edibles? In fact, I prefer cool season edibles. <laughs> I mean, who likes gardening out in the heat and ah, the sweat and the bugs? Uh, I know a lot of people do. So yeah. Some people love the heat, but right. I, I'm not. I'm a wimp. <laughs> I often tell people that once it gets to be high summer, I want to go in the house and lie down and wait for October. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but I think oh, it's man. easier to garden in the, in the fall and spring. And some of these uh, things we're going to talk about today will actually overwinter yeah. pretty well. And um, I'm all about pretty as well. Yeah. Okay. As a as a human, I like to eat, but as I also enjoy beauty. So uh -huh. what we're going to talk about today is not only edible, but it'll be pretty in your landscape or in your winter containers. And a lot of people do like to do the winter containers. I personally like to have something right there on the deck I can oh, cool. snag and grab and put in the kitchen without having to run out to the garden in the rain or the cold. Okay, makes sense to me. All right. So which vegetables would you like to start with then? I guess if you made me pick just one. Just one. Oh, I may have to go with the chards. Okay. You like chard, all right. I like chard. I, honestly, I, I don't eat it as much as I like to look at it. Uh, yeah, but I can eat it, and I do like any kind of green, actually, chopped up. I always said if you put enough garlic and bacon in anything, it's going to oh, taste good right. and good bacon for you. Uh -huh. I, I can get with that. <laughs> but chard is so easily grown, um, and they have so many colors. Uh, the last few years, it's gotten easy to find some of the rainbow chards, mm -hmm. even at the yeah. vegetable sections at most any garden center. And they're uh, very tough. They hold up well through freezes. And that's the thing. Some of these things we plant as cool season, the old, I want to kind of diss what people call flowering cabbage or flowering kale. Yes. They look like big, beautiful yes. purple or white or pink roses. Mm -hmm. um, because they melt. Once we have a good hard <laughs> freeze, they're, pff, they're they, mush. They, go down. Yeah. they do. So that's one reason the chards, in fact, I've had chard over winter well, look good through spring, even not bolt in the heat of summer. And bolting, of course, is flowering and going to seed, okay. which is usually the death of a uh, biennial type plant like that or a winter annual. And it will um, come back not as soon as we start to get some cool weather, it starts to flourish again. Mm. So I, I really have had them almost act like short lived perennials. Okay. okay. Two to three years sometimes I have one That's in my garden. It's a long time, yeah, two or three years. Okay. The bad thing is in the summer, of course, the insects do like to eat it. And uh, you do have to worry about the same kinds of insects that would eat your cabbage. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to watch them for that and, and monitor for pest issues. Okay, so they're pretty much the same pests as well, okay. The colors, though, are what are so amazing. Uh, mostly it's stem color, but a lot of them will have deeply colored leaves as well. But the colors can be red, orange, hot pink, hmm. white. They're just incredible. Oh, right. And they're a plant that I like to say plays with light. I've been <laughs> developing a program called Light and Shadow in the Garden. Okay. And you know enough about me that uh, you know I designed my house uh -huh. so that the deck is backlit from my kitchen sink right. as the sun is setting and it makes everything kind of glow. I call mm -hmm. it the magic hour. <laughs> it gilds and it makes translucent leaves glow like stained glass. And the, wow. the chards are like that. They really do beautiful things with light. Okay. So you, you do like chard, don't you? I do like right, chard. I can go, like chard a little bit. Uh, and, and it, I said rainbow, but there's neon lights, bright lights. You can there there are a range of colors, yeah. but you can also order solid colors okay. if you want all red or, or UT orange. Yeah, I've had the bright orange light. Orange. Yeah, I like that bright light. Yeah, yeah. For sure. All right, now what about kale? Well, uh, I like to eat kale uh. again. <laughs> and, uh, the way you cook it is all about that. And I like young kale in, in salads. That's, that's yummy. Yeah. Chop it up mm -hmm. fine and, and, and put a lot of good stuff in there. 
But the, uh, the kale that I love and I was so impressed with, I fell in love with up north. They were using it in Chicago oh, wow. Botanic Garden mm -hmm. and Minnesota in downtown planning, so there's a little bit of a heat island. Mm -hmm. And it would hold up through the winter months. And I was like, gosh, that's incredible. The red boar is a deep, red. rich purple. Mm -hmm. I mean, the ruffles right. are insane, the texture on that thing. And it grows like a little tree. So if you're, if you're doing a container combination, you know the old recipe, Thriller, filler, yeah, spiller. spiller right? It yeah. does. It does a great job as that thriller. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> there is a, re a a green one too, winter boar, that's uh, beautiful. I mean, it's a light green. In case you need some green, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. It's a color too. Yeah. Just a color too. <laughs> it's a co it's a color too. <laughs> All right. So they um, they're not always available locally, although some of our local growers have started supplying it because there is good demand for it. I know uh, some of the people up at Real Foot at the resort area there, the Butterfly Gardens, have been carrying that now. But, so growers are, you have to find it, at the, you can find it from them, maybe let them know that you want it. You can buy it, actually buy it in gallon pots or in six packs usually. Okay, all right, six packs. All right, so let's run through some of these quickly, all right? Purple mustard. Oh, oh easy, oh, easy. It's Ooh. so easy. Now it will get bitten a little bit in a real hard freeze. But it's one of those, if you get the uh, giant red mustard, yes, yes, that's such a beauty. It is. And it's got this fabulous crumpled puckered texture to the leaf. And if it does get knocked back a little bit in the winter, a couple of warm back. weeks, it comes right back out. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's a really good one. And easy, you can just kind of throw the seed around. I actually go around and sprinkle it in some of my gardens and pots as summer wanes, right about Labor Day. And some of it just comes up as the other things are dying down. Mm. Okay. okay. What about some of the Asian vegetables? Asian, uh, I kind of always liked Asian vegetables anyway, Napa cabbage and such, mm -hmm. but I fished an Asian vegetable catalog out of the garbage one day at work. Somebody had thrown out. Oh my God. <laughs> and I went crazy. Uh, the tatsoys, oh, oh they're so beautiful. Oh, the glossy yeah. foliage and they're like little flattened roses and they come in greens and purples. Oh, they're just gorgeous things. And there's lots of other, lots of daikon, lots of radishes, lots of hybrid greens. You could go nuts, um, and and I, you know, you can get online and sure. find, find a lot of these as well. <clears throat> sure. <laughs> now I want to talk about the dinosaur kale before right, we get away from kale, because it is one of your very very toughest. It's okay. a blue 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 green, blue. and again that gorgeous puckered texture, and it's a mm -hmm. very arching plant that kind of gives a little umbrella effect over everything. And I always have to tell the story about Felder rushing. Uh, yeah. You know, he's no, got his well. truck garden. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He, he, he likes to put the vegetable garden in the back of his truck because right. he says that's his argument against people who say, I don't have time to garden. Oh. And it goes with him everywhere. <laughs> yeah, and I've he says yeah. the dinosaur kale holds up to, you know, cold 70 mile an hour winds with absolutely <laughs> no damage. So that's wow. a pretty good testament. It is. It's also free insect control. Oh, ah, you're, you're blowing that. the bugs off. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> makes yeah. sense. All right, there I got go. it. I got it. <clears throat> so let's let's hit the uh, evergreen herbs. Can Ooh, you do that? I do. Uh, parsley number one, because okay. parsley is going to stay green through most of our winter unless we have a really severe cold snap. Okay. Cilantro, not quite so much. And a lot of people want to plant that in the spring and it's yeah, going to quickly bolt. Mm -hmm. It actually does better as a fall crop. And then it'll make it through a milder winter, fine with no dinging, and then all through spring as well. So you get several months of parsley. Okay. And often cilantro if we don't have a really cold w winter. Mm. And the green is just fabulous, especially on the parsley. The flat leaf parsley is the most um, desired culinary wise, but the little crinkly, fine textured one, the, the fern leaf that mm. is the crispa, has got the gorgeous, most gorgeous color to it. So do those. Also, oregano is going to okay. be one of your evergreen perennial herbs. Thyme will also work. And rosemary, though, borderline sensitive to cold. So I usually use rosemary in a pot that I can easily pull back onto the porch or into the garage if we have a really cold snap. Okay. Really but add cool. those to your winter containers, a few pops of pansies, which are edible too. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. For yeah. the They're bright edible. color, yeah. and you've got edible and beauty. Edible and beauty. Thank you, Ms. Carey. That's good stuff. Edible and beauty. I like that. I like that. Thank you much. About a week ago, we planted broccoli and cauliflower here in the square foot garden, and it's fall. And the bugs have had all year to build up their population, and so they tend, with the fall crops, if you have fall brassicas, they tend to attack and they can skeletonize and kill your plants in a day. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna preventatively spray BT on these plants so that 
if any of these cabbage worms or cabbage loopers try to eat these plants, they will very quickly die. So all I have to do here is I just have to make sure that I have the leaves covered so it doesn't take a lot. And that was it. Six plants protected. Now if any of them land, they'll die. I'll have to make sure that I keep track of when it rains and come out here and reapply after it rains so that as the plants grow, they continue to be protected. All right, here's our Q&A segment. Y'all ready? Yes. All right, these yep. are good questions. Good. Here's our first viewer email. Why do my hydrangeas look like this? They look like they would be beautiful, but they turned out bad. And this is <laughs> Rasul from Brentwood, New York. Mm -hmm. So we'll start with you, Joel. Why do they look like that? And do well, they look bad to you? I don't think they look that bad. Well. I, have, I have some hydrangeas that look worse than that. <laughs> but you do notice that there are spent uh, flower heads on there. Mm -hmm. So it did bloom this year, that year, this year yeah. for him. Good point. Uh, it's got some yeah. spots on it. Yeah, it's but that's, cosmetic. Yeah, I mean, it's cosmetic. It's, yeah. It is the end of the season and you know it's been hot and so people have put a lot of water on it. So you know maybe it's just stressed from the, the weather. Yeah. It's environmental conditions that's caused it. Yeah. I agree with I her. That's that. exactly what I was going to say. It didn't look that bad to me. Uh, mm -mm. And I don't know a hydrangea that this time of year looks good right. because they get that leaf spot. <laughs> right, they get right. the leaf you spot. Know. Right, which is just So she can just cosmetic. sort of clean it up, you know, print out the bad stuff if it really bothers her. There were some right. dead twigs and things, and she could clean it up, but I wouldn't worry about the leaf spot because we're fixing to get into the winter. It's going to drop its leaves right. anyway, so That's just right. rake and up those old leaves. I was just saying, collect the leaves. Yeah. Right. Sanitation. <laughs> right. Don't leave right. the, the disease sanitation. on the ground. Right. And it'll be fine. It'll yeah. be fine. Right. Yeah. 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 Mulch it, and yeah, everything will be good with it. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Rasul. Thank you for that. And yeah, they don't look bad. All right. Here's our next viewer email. This is an interesting question. Why can't you save the seeds from a tomato and grow the same tomato with good production? I'm interested in indeterminate varieties like Big Beef and determinate varieties like Celebrity. And this is Carolyn. So, Doc, what do you think about that one? Well, first, okay, I guess first. I'm just getting old, but the, <laughs> the, the question was a little confusing to me, okay. exactly what she was asking. Right. Uh, but right. I think she's asking about seed coming true. Okay. You know, from right. collecting seed from her current plants and then they're not coming true. Well, that happens obviously with hybrids. Right. You know, you're right. going to revert back to one of the parents. So if she wants that same tomato again, she's just going to have to get the seed or buy the plant. But now they are open pollinated mm -hmm. varieties mm -hmm. of tomatoes like Brandywine, right. some of the aware loom that, you know, do come true from seed. Right. So I think that's the question. She's concerned about why can't she grow you know, the tomatoes, if she collects the seed like she had. So I think it's a hybrid problem. Right, and that's something that you and I talked about earlier. Yeah. Joel and I talked yeah. about it as well. Yeah. So, Joel, you want yeah. to add anything to that? Yeah, I mean, it's nice that she wants to do that, but she is going to have to go to the more heirloom and, and uh, self-pollinating varieties that right. are, are used to coming back from the seed. In fact, that's how they get the seed for them. They just grow them and then collect right. the seeds right. for the heirlooms. Right. And the heirlooms are good, of course. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Good, good production. Yeah. It may not have the disease resistance. That's true. Uh, That's but true. they are good. They are. They have, to me, they have a better taste. Mm -hmm. I just I hate to agree. say it. But brandy wine, I mean, I grow it every year. And it's, I love the taste of it. Okay. You know, you get that really tomato taste. <laughs> it makes a big sore on your tongue, you know. It's <laughs> lovely. I love it. <laughs> yeah. She loves it. Yeah. <laughs> love tomatoes. So there you have it, Ms. Carolyn. Thank you for that question. I hope that answers that for you, okay? <coughs> Here's our next viewer email, okay? How long will an herbicide application remain effective after a rainfall? Should I immediately reapply after it rains? Thanks. And this is Phil from Alexander, North Carolina. Ooh. So, Joel. Yeah. Interesting, right? Yes. All right, so what do you think about that? Well, you know, you really need to le read on the label. I would do because that. A lot of times it says you have you can apply this two hours before a rain shower or four hours mm -hmm. or six hours. I mean, it depends on what the herbicide is mm -hmm. and what the label right. says. But four hours is a good average for, for all of them, but mostly it has to dry. Right. And if it once it dries on there, mm -hmm. there's and it can, it can rain on it because the plants already absorbed it. And you just have to wait. Yeah. For it to take effect. This. Yeah. yeah. I, Exactly. Uh -huh. I think that uh, Roundup 
you know, yeah. glyphosate right. is the most used herbicide out there. So probably she's thinking about that one. And I read the label, and the label says to not apply it if you know rain's coming yes. three hours before. Yes. That it has to stay on there at least yes. three hours. But I had lawn companies that I read about that said if you get it on there and it stays there and gets dry, that, you know, in key. 30 minutes. Yeah. yeah, it's getting it dry yeah. and not applying it even when the foliage is wet. Right. Which I've been in a hurry and I couldn't wait for the dew to dry. <laughs> you know, I want to kill these weeds. But, you know, obviously you're diluting it. Right. Because the, the leaves are wet and it can just slide off and mix That's with right. the water and just slide off, you know, with the droplets. But really read the label because it will tell you, you know, how long that needs to be on there before rain, after rain, whatever. It will tell you that. Right. Got yeah. to read the label. Yeah, right. always read the label. Yeah. Not, yeah. It will lose its efficacy. Exactly. Right. So you have to definitely yep. uh, read that and, uh, yeah, watch the weather forecast maybe. Yeah. yeah. That might help as well. Right? Yeah. You definitely want to make sure it's dry. So thank you uh, for that question, Phil. Appreciate that. So, Dr. Kelly, y'all, we're done. Oh, wow. Thank you much. That was fun. Hot dog. That was good. All right. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplot at wkno.org and the mailing address is familyplot 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for watching. If you want to learn more about any of the flowers Joel implanted or the plants Carol talked about, go to familyplotgarden.com. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.